Tonight, a Manitoba man charged with five counts of first degree murder. An entire family has been lost. This is a dark time in Manitoba. What we now know about the accused and the victims, including his three young children. She loved those kids more than anything in the world. Why Canada's Auditor General says not even she can figure out just how many millions of dollars the Arrive Can app really cost taxpayers. This is probably some of the worst financial record keeping that I've seen. And putting artificial intelligence to work to help fight climate change and even predict natural disasters. It actually is like an electronic nose that can actually smell a fire. From CBC News, this is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. A Manitoba community is grappling tonight with incredible shock. Five lives cut short and one man now charged with five counts of first degree murder. The victims, a mother, three young children and a teenager. They were all related to each other and all connected to the accused. They were discovered at three separate crime scenes in southern Manitoba. A house in the town of Carmen, along a highway just to the south, and another road about 70 kilometers to the north. There are still a lot of unanswered questions about what happened and why the police investigation is just getting underway. Karen Pauls takes us through the sequence of terrible events. She loved those kids. She loved those kids more than anything in the world. Shaking, teary, and numb, Nancy Clearwater points at photos of her family, including her daughter and grandchildren, now gone. Amanda Clearwater was the young woman hit to three children, Bethany, Jason, and Isabella Manokizek, and then Maya Grattan was my niece and she was in the house. She is in mourning, while her daughter's 29-year-old common-law partner, the children's father, is behind bars. Evidence that was gathered yesterday evening and early this morning has led, in close consultation with the Crown, to the laying of five first-degree murder charges against Ryan Manakisic. RCMP say Amanda Clearwater's body was found Sunday along a highway south of Carmen. Hours later, the bodies of her three young children, aged six, four, and two and a half months, were found at the scene of a burned out vehicle. Earlier, police said a witness pulled them from the flames. Further information has revealed that it was the suspect that removed the children from the vehicle. This was the final crime scene discovered, the victim's home in the rural community of Carmen, where the 17-year-old was found. Neighbors left with so many questions. I don't understand why, why the kids had to be involved. In Winnipeg, leaders expressed their sorrow. There is no explanation that can make this okay. This is pure darkness. The community is rallying around the family, offering comfort and support. There's a man here in town that's going to cover all five funerals. Wow, how does that make you feel? Uh, shocked and in disbelief that somebody would do this. Extraordinary. Karen, what are police saying so far about a motive? Well, ex understanding exactly why is going to take some time. First degree murder charges suggest some degree of premeditation or planning, but police aren't elaborating on that just yet. Now, we are learning a little bit about the accused from court documents. In 2019, he pleaded guilty to mischief for vandalizing a Tim Hortons. He was given a conditional discharge and told to get an assessment for mental health and addictions and to undergo any court ordered treatment. But we don't know if he did any of that. Adrian? All right, Karen Pauls in Carmen, Manitoba. Thank you. Now to Ottawa, where Canada's Auditor General is slamming the federal government and how it botched the Arrive Can project. The app was meant to track travelers during the pandemic, but a new audit says tracking the true cost of that app is impossible. Catherine Cullen now with the calls for accountability. Karen Hogan has worked on audits for decades. Arrive Can, she says, is like a manual for what not to do. It's probably some of um, 
the, the worst record keeping I have seen in, in a long time. Record keeping around the travel app was so bad, the Auditor General says she still can't be sure how much was spent on it. The best estimate is nearly $60 million. I would tell you that we paid too much for this application. The use of outside contractors to do work government employees couldn't drove up that price. According to the Auditor General, if the Government of Canada had done this kind of IT work, it would have cost an average of $675 a day. Instead, with ArriveCan contractors, it cost nearly $1,100, almost double. The Auditor General also found the biggest chunk of the money flowed to a company of just two people, GC Strategies, who she says helped the government write the contract requirements. This gave GC Strategies an advantage that other potential bidders did not have. The opposition leader lays it all at the Prime Minister's feet. He's taken 60 million of your tax dollars and given it to a corrupt app, a rive scam. We recognize with hindsight that things should have clearly been done differently. The government says changes are already being made and the pandemic meant they had to act quickly to create the app. But officials insist it's not an excuse. In no way are we going to defend this particular contracting process. A point the Auditor General drove home. I don't believe that an emergency is a reason to forget that public servants need to um, be answerable to Canadians. Catherine, it seems pretty clear there are some serious repercussions percolating here. Yeah, absolutely, Adrian. Not only tied to ArriveCan, but broader questions about how contracts have been awarded at the Canada Border Services Agency. Two senior civil servants have been suspended without pay. There is a border services investigation underway, which some MPs have publicly said has led to scary and deeply troubling issues being raised, though just what that means isn't yet public. And the Border Services Agency has called in the RCMP to look at some of the issues around certain employees and contractors. In short, the political problems here have the potential to get worse. Adrian. All right, more to come. Catherine Cullen in Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you. And Ottawa is adding its voice to international pressure, expressing concern over the potential of an Israeli ground invasion in southern Gaza. But after rescuing two Israeli hostages overnight, Israel says it's not backing down. And as Margaret Evans is about to show us, that rescue came alongside deadly Israeli airstrikes. How long to take in the enormity of your loss, to sit by the side of a dead child and realize you can't follow. These were the scenes in the aftermath of heavy Israeli strikes in Rafa in the early hours. More than 60 people killed, according to Palestinian officials in Gaza. He was born a month and a half ago, says Syed al Hams, of the baby in his arms. The airstrikes, more than a dozen according to witnesses, came as Israeli special forces said they staged a hostage rescue, releasing footage of Israeli troops storming a building and driving away with the two captives in an armored vehicle. In Israel, there were open arms waiting for Fernando Marman and Louis Haar, both abducted from kibbutz near Yitzhak during the Hamas attacks inside Israel on October 7th. A lot of tears, hugs, not many words. Our son-in-law wants his government to negotiate a deal with Hamas for the remaining hostages, believed to number more than 100. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, today. We want it done as soon as possible. Last November, 81 hostages were released, most of them Israeli, during a five-day truce when 180 Palestinians were also released from Israeli jails. But Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu insists Hamas only understands force. He's threatening a ground invasion against Hamas militants in Rafah, where more than one million people now shelter. Israeli allies are pressuring Netanyahu to change course. We want Israel to stop and think very seriously before it takes any further action. But above all, what we want is an immediate pause in the fighting. And we want that pause to lead to a ceasefire. The European Union's foreign policy chief went further. So if the international community believes that this is a slaughter, that too many people are being killed, 
Maybe they have to think about the provision of arms. In Gaza, people who have already lost everything, including faith in a watching world, are bracing for more. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Canada's foreign affairs minister is also expressing concern over the possibility of an Israeli ground invasion of Rafah. The operation would be devastating and is devastating to Palestinians and all those seeking refuge, including foreign nationals. Melanie Jolie also repeated calls for a sustainable ceasefire, a deal to get hostages out and more humanitarian aid into Gaza. Jolie also announced she'll be in Washington Tuesday and will discuss the war with the U.S. Secretary of State and her Jordanian counterpart. There's more reaction tonight in Washington and beyond to Donald Trump's comments over the weekend that, if re-elected, he would leave NATO allies to fend for themselves if they don't meet defense spending requirements. Katie Simpson now with the fallout. There is a fresh sense of fear. Russian aggression, already ravaging Ukraine, may grow bolder after Donald Trump suggested NATO allies are on their own if he retakes the White House. What Donald Trump is telling Russia is that if you invade Europe, the United States will not come to Europe's defense. Europe is yours. It's, it's effectively an invitation for World War III. USA! USA! At a weekend campaign rally, Trump endorsed abandoning NATO countries who don't meet defense spending targets if faced with a Russian attack. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. While Canada is among the two-thirds of NATO countries that do not hit defense spending targets, Ottawa is brushing off Trump's remarks as campaign bluster. We're going to hear you know, rhetorical statements um, that I, I don't think we need to overreact to, but I, th I think we need to make sure that we are prepared. Though some European leaders are bracing for a possible future without U.S. support. I think the conclusion has to be written already now that Europe uh, needs to be stronger uh, and we need to do... We need to be able to do more on our own. Toutefois, chaque minute... Every minute counts to prepare Europeans to absorb the shock of a scenario described perfectly by Trump, said the French foreign minister. The Biden administration is trying to reassure allies that as long as Joe Biden remains in office, the U.S. is staunchly committed to NATO. But reassurances don't mean as much in an election year when the outcome is far from predictable. Katie Simpson, CBC News. Washington. The Canadian military's former head of HR testified at his sexual assault trial, telling an Ottawa court he did not rape a woman on board a Navy ship more than 30 years ago. Kayla Hounsell takes us through his testimony. One week into his trial, retired Vice Admiral Hayden Edmondson arrives at court to testify in his own defense. Very unusual to do that. It happens occasionally on the advice of counsel. This expert in military law points out Edmondson has the right not to testify. Now 60, he's charged with one count of committing indecent acts and one count of sexual assault. It's very, very risky because the accused who testify is also subject to cross-examination with the same rigor and same robustness uh, as the victim would have gone through. Edmondson's accuser, whose identity is protected by a publication ban, told the court she was 19 in 1991. She said it was part of her job to wake officers for their night shifts, and she found Edmondson, who was then 27, naked. She testified he later raped her in his quarters, but Edmondson testified he did not expose himself and did not have any kind of sexual contact with her. Usually, whatever it is that's alleged to have happened, uh, happens in private, so there's not a lot of witnesses. A friend of the woman did tell the court she had gone searching for the woman the night she alleges Edmondson assaulted her. She testified she eventually saw her shaky and trembling. But Edmondson's lawyer suggested the friend's testimony wasn't based on her own recollection, but rather that the details had been provided to her by a CBC News reporter. Edmondson testified he was directed to retire in 2022, as a result of these charges. The public perception in cases like these is that a person is often guilty. Um, and that's not the case legally. Um, and it's the court's job to decide whether or not the Crown is able to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The Crown will cross-examine Edmondson Tuesday. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, 
Ottawa. An Ontario woman has pleaded guilty to fraud after falsely claiming Inuit status for her twin daughters who later received big scholarships reserved for Indigenous students. But as Juanita Taylor shows us from Ikaluwe, this case is about much more than money. Can I bring? I do, yeah. Friends and family gathered at Noah Noah's house to show their support. We've been, definitely been very happy with the outcome. It was very emotional. Um, and it, uh, it was justice for mom, for sure. That justice came Friday when Karima Manji pleaded guilty to one count of fraud over $5,000. Manji falsely listed Noah's mother, Kitty Noah, as the birth mother of her twins, Amira and Nadia Gill, in order to get them Inuit status. The twins were also charged with fraud, but those charges were withdrawn. It's a shame the, uh, the twins didn't get anything, but we're happy that they got the mom. Kitty Noah died last summer. She and Manji knew each other when Manji lived here in Iqaluit for a short time during the 90s. Manji then moved to Ontario, where her twins were born in 1998. In an agreed statement of facts, Manji admitted she provided her daughters with fraudulent Inuit enrollment cards and that they were unaware the cards were fraudulent. The statement also reveals the Gill sisters received close to $160,000 in scholarships meant for Inuit students. Lawyer Ann Crawford says this particular Indigenous identity theft stands out. The criminal charges against the twins have been dropped, but that doesn't mean it's the end of the story. There's still the possibility of a civil lawsuit to reclaim the money. Nunavutungavik Incorporated maintains the Inuit enrollment list. It says this case is about more than just money. It's a fraudulent case, um, but I think it begs the question about whether or not there needs to be a larger discussion about non-Indigenous peoples claiming Indigenous identity. Noah Noah agrees. Posing as a, an Indigenous person should be a, a crime in this country. Karima Manji will be sentenced in June. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Iqaluit. And CBC News has learned a planned visit to Canada by King Charles is now on hold following his cancer diagnosis. The visit was never officially announced, but Canadian government sources say Charles and Camilla were due to visit in late May. Buckingham Palace hasn't said what kind of cancer the king has, only that treatment has begun and his doctors have advised him to postpone public-facing duties. If you have been coughing for weeks on end, you're not alone, but there's a good reminder from doctors tonight. Most of the time, the patient's own cough will resolve on its own without any medication or treatment. <coughs> when you should be worried about that nagging cough, next. Plus, species on the brink. Hunting. Uh, taking for food, taking for sport, taking for sale. Why so many migratory animals are facing extinction. And later, in the dark of night, an unforgettable experience. The plume of smoke just had like an atomic feel to it. An Alberta photographer gets up close and personal with a volcano. We're back in two. A small plane carrying four Canadian skydivers crashed in southern Mexico on Sunday, killing one person on the ground. The pilot attempted an emergency landing but crashed on a busy beach. The 62-year-old victim died at the scene. Local officials say the Canadians on board were taken for medical treatment and are in stable condition. If you've been plagued by a persistent cough this winter, you are in good company. And while it may be frustrating, a new report suggests patience is key to getting better. Lauren Pelly takes a look at the latest guidance. <coughs> Canadians know the feeling, a cough that just won't quit. I still have it. <laughs> yeah, it comes and goes. I do normally wait it out myself. Uh, if it were to last for weeks, though, I would definitely go into the doctor. Usually, um, you know, home remedies, so like hot water, you know, mixed with turmeric. That's what we do in our culture. <coughs> so what's the best way to tackle a <coughs> nagging cough? A trio of doctors writing Monday in the Canadian Medical Association Journal say if a cough follows an infection, it's usually just a waiting game. We look through the evidence of what can be used to treat or stop a post-infectious cough. 
And the answer, surprisingly, is time and patience. This family doctor says he's only talking about cases where someone had a known viral infection beforehand, like a cold or the flu. Most of the time, the patient's own cough will resolve on its own without any medication or treatment. But it lasts a lot longer than you think, anywhere from three to eight weeks total. <laughs> But if a cough lasts beyond two months, it can signal a deeper health issue. Physicians say other red flags can include coughing up blood, shortness of breath, wheezing, or difficulty swallowing. In those cases, conditions like asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, or even whooping cough could be the culprit. And you might need treatment like an inhaler or other medications. If the cough has been persistent for up to six to eight weeks, um, then at least to do a basic chest x-ray to make sure there's no underlying serious underlying lung disease. Doctors say getting a proper diagnosis is important, but for most run-of-the-mill coughs caused by a virus, there's not much they can do. So the advice is just wait it out. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. An update tonight on a story we brought you Thursday about new research commissioned by the Federal Privacy Commissioner into how patient data is handled by companies doing direct-to-consumer virtual medical care. So those are companies that have a software platform or app that allows you to get a sort of virtual walk-in medical appointment. The research published last week concluded that Canadians, quote, should be aware that the direct-to-consumer virtual care industry in Canada highly values patient data and appears to view data as a revenue stream. We want to update that story with the responses from three companies we mentioned. Rocket Doctor says it does not sell any patient data for marketing or commercial gain. Telus Health says it doesn't sell any of its patient data. And Maple says it doesn't exploit patient data for commercial or marketing gain. We regret not including those comments in our original report. You can read the full story on our website or scan a QR code. Coming up, more than one in five of the world's migratory species are at risk of going extinct, according to a new UN report. About 80% of the Canadian bird fauna is migratory. How it could affect ecosystems in Canada and beyond. Plus, in the midst of a housing crisis, more and more Canadians are living in tents. Look, look what we're tolerating, look what we're putting up with. How one man lived that reality and fought to change it for himself and others and the hidden cost of artificial intelligence. It's very easy to view this as an abstract thing on your computer that doesn't have any impact, but it, but it does. How AI helps fight climate change despite its carbon footprint. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. A new UN report says many of the world's migratory animals could soon disappear from the skies and the seas. On and around now on which species are most at risk and why. This is where we study uh, bird migration. To see just what migratory birds have to go through, here at Western University, they get them moving. About 80% of the Canadian bird fauna is migratory. They do amazing physiological feats. They'll fly all night long, maybe 12 hours without stopping. The challenges these birds and other migratory species face are the focus of a landmark UN report, covering nearly 1,200 species of birds, mammals, insects, and fish. One in five of those is threatened with extinction. And for fish, it's even worse. The main problem at sea, say experts, human exploitation. Hunting, uh, taking for food, taking for sport, taking for sale. And then the second type of, of impact or threat is bycatch or, or un, unintended or incidental capture. In other words, fish are being killed even when they aren't the target. For birds, necessary pit stops along the way used to be safe. Now more are shrinking and toxic. They're flying north during the spring migration directly through the agricultural activities of spring seeding, spring spraying. The value, say experts, of these animals freely moving is what they bring across different ecosystems. Salmon, when they migrate upstream into these you know, nutrient-poor areas, they bring nutrients from the ocean with them. There's pest control, like, you know, what would our... What would our forests be like without migratory birds? Part of a complex engine, and losing these moving parts 
could destroy ecosystems that ultimately help humans and animals thrive. Anand Ram, CBC News, London, Ontario. Now it's time to dig deeper into the news shaping our world. AI has a mammoth carbon footprint. But it's not all bad. How it's also a shield against climate impacts. But first, a charismatic young man becomes the unlikely champion for people down and out in Nova Scotia. He just loves sharing like that. Making the case that the province shortchanges desperate people by imposing the label homeless. He said, look, I do own my own accommodation. It's pretty modest, but I own it. Bradley Lowe had a lot riding on his legal appeal to authorities. Tom Murphy breaks down one man's fight to help people living in misery, a fight that's not yet over. When is a tent a home? I do own my own accommodation. That is the crux of the argument over whether to more than double the amount of income assistance for some people living rough in Nova Scotia. It's pretty modest, but I own it. The outcome could dramatically change the lives of so many who right now don't seem to have much of a life at all. This is the story of a likable guy living rough who could become an unlikely agent of change. Like a lot of people that live in the area or live on the street or in tents, this is where they come to stay warm for the day. Laura Walton was working at Halifax Central Library's front desk last fall when Bradley Lowe struck up a friendship with her. I was just chatting to him about, I loved his hair color. He was like, oh yeah, I want to grow it and donate it. And it's like, oh, like that's unexpected. That's not what I would expect to hear. Yeah. But he just loved sharing, like that's what he wanted to do. So that was a very admirable quality and something really different. Just down the street, Victoria Park. Among downtown Halifax's most expensive condos, a tent encampment. Here, lawyer Vince Calderhead came to know that same bright light, Bradley Lowe, who was living in a tent here. It's all he could afford. Right off the bat, he seemed kind of special, quite unique. He told me about his situation and, and uh, the fact that he needed income assistance and how much he was getting. And uh, when he told me the amount, that was just outrageous. Bradley Lowe was receiving $380 a month from the province. But under provincial regulations, someone who rents a place to live or owns a home and has a disability or chronic mental condition could get the enhanced rate of $950 per month. Could Bradley appeal his income assistance? And he looked at me and I looked at him and he said, look, I do own my own accommodation. It's pretty modest, but I own it. And, uh, you know, he had stuff there. He had to make arrangements. He had ongoing shelter costs. So he felt he fit the definition? Yeah, he totally did. Bradley Lowe became hooked on prescription opioids as a teenager recovering from an injury. Through his 20s, he worked in construction and kitchens, and he was in and out of rehab, battled depression and anxiety, an addict who recently was drug-free, and his favorite title, father. Yeah, yeah, four years old, uh, and uh, he said, look, I've got to... I've got to get myself together for my son. I've got to maintain uh, on the straight and narrow for my son. I've, uh, I don't want to go into high-risk situations. Why? It's bad for him, but more importantly, to maintain his relationship with his son. It'd be nice to give people at least some, some level of funding that's beyond a few hundred dollars a month. Michael Ganuick works with opioid addicts. He says his patients have a fighting chance at a better life, living away from the turmoil and the temptation in the tents. If you're unhoused, how could you ever focus on, you know, improving your mental well-being or, you know, getting treatment for an addiction? It's really the priority is housing. And so uh, giving people who are unhoused the financial support to maybe help them get closer to housing is so important for them to meet their other health needs. Last month, Bradley and his lawyer made their case for more money before the Income Assistance Appeal Board. We had come back from the hearing and he said to me, Look, it's, it's really fortunate that we met because I, uh, among all the people in the encampment, I feel I'm both together enough and, and focused enough to pull this off 
but also I'm determined to see this through. Then, a week later, not long before Christmas, Bradley overdosed a possible drug poisoning. News of his death hit hard. That same day that Laura Walton learned of Bradley's passing, another tenter had overdosed in front of her at the library. So our security guard was able to use Narcan to revive them, which was great. And then when I was talking to one of the other security guards about it, he was like, yeah, it's really sad, you know, like what happened to Brad? So I hadn't heard about that at that point. So, you know, when he told me that, it was so sad because to see someone revived, I don't know them, but you would hope someone like Brad would have been revived and that someone I would have loved for someone to have been there to help him because he was someone who wanted to help other people. So it was really sad. Yeah. And the cruelty of it all? Bradley Lowe was in line for a bed in a rooming house just two days later. In mid-January, a month after his passing, the board dismissed Bradley's appeal. So what is the best way to help those in tents? The province argues increasing income allowance rates right now is not the way to go. It says it has spent millions on shelters. Best for people living in tents to take immediate refuge there, according to the Minister of Community Services, Trevor Boudreau. We've put the money forward to, to provide that support for people who are living in, in, in encampments. And so, you know, it, it is a challenge. People are saying they don't want to go. And, and, and this is, you know, this is frustrating because we have a space that is, is, that is available. We have capacity there right now. Vince Calderhead says many who have mental health issues or drug addictions won't leave their tent home, such as they are, because the shelters have no sense of community and too many rules, including around drug use. He says it's hard to not let the futility of it all set in. This is an ongoing struggle, and, and for people who are trying to get their human rights respected, Canada and Nova Scotia have have uh, agreed that everyone is entitled to an adequate standard of living. And look, look what we're tolerating, look what we're putting up with. I mean, people living in remarkably inadequate circumstances. Tom, this is really hard. And, and for those people who are living in tents uh, in Nova Scotia, hoping to get more income assistance, what happens for them now? Well, Bradley Lowe's lawyer has applied for a judicial review of his case to try to get that failed appeal overturned. Now, if successful, the lawyer argues Bradley's income assistance should be paid retroactively to Bradley's estate and eventually, the hope would be at least, to Bradley's son. And if the lawyer wins the case, he says it could be precedent-setting, at least in the province of Nova Scotia. What's the reaction amongst some of the people who are living uh, in these tents about this potential change in income assistance like this? Yeah, it's been interesting. I know that in, in talking to people on the street here who are trying to help tenters navigate the system, there is some hope. There are certainly lots of people living rough who knew Bradley and are really rooting for him and his cause even after, after his death. So we'll have to see how it goes. They're, they're waiting with much interest. I know, I know we're talking primarily about Nova Scotia, but can you pull back a little bit for us and, and let us know where Nova, Nova Scotia sits in comparison with the other provinces on this? Yeah, it's really difficult to compare province to province because they all administer social assistance in their own way. In Ontario, a homeless person only gets money for shelter once a, quote, dwelling is retained. But in New Brunswick, the government there says there is no deduction to social assistance uh, based on accommodation type. So there seems to be little uniformity even as the number of tents in our cities seems to increase, Adrian. All right, Tom Murphy in Halifax, thank you. You're welcome. Coming up, artificial intelligence is already being used to fight the effects of climate change, but it also contributes to the problem. We'll break down why next, plus. Everybody was outside with their luggage, marveling at those giant fountains of lava. An Alberta man captures a surreal night in the glow of an Icelandic volcano. The two sides of AI.
The AI touches up the skin, sharpens details like grass and trees. Yes, a big carbon footprint, larger and larger, generating a lot of heat, but also a secret weapon in the fight for the planet. Nicole Mortolaro breaks down how AI can act as a buffer between you and a changing climate. Have you ever used artificial intelligence like TikTok filters to turn yourself into an astronaut or ride a dragon? It's fun and harmless, right? Not quite. AI generates millions of images a day. And according to a recent study, just one image can consume as much energy as charging your phone. That's right. Just like most things, AI has a carbon footprint. We definitely shouldn't um, kind of view AI as a costless thing. I think it's very easy to view this as abstract thing on your computer that doesn't have any impact, but it, but it does. So where did those emissions come from? Well, around the world, most AI is hosted in data centers like this one. That sound you're hearing, those are fans being used to keep the hardware cool as these computers are sucking up a lot of electricity and generating a lot of heat. Running AI is running any other computer program. You have an input, you want an output, it's going to do lots and lots of operations. And doing lots of operations for one answer means that there's a lot of energy and electricity. From Netflix recommendations to smart cars and image filters, AI is a big part of our everyday lives. According to the International Energy Agency, data centers and transmission networks account for 1% of global energy-related emissions. That's almost as much as the aviation industry. And AI is a quickly growing piece of that. But it's not all bad. It's also an important tool in the climate fight. AI is being used in all sorts of ways to address climate action, from helping us better forecast solar and wind on the power grid to help us better integrate those into power grids, to helping better optimize heating and cooling systems in buildings to help kind of improve the efficiency of those systems. In the global south, climate change is increasing locust outbreaks and threatening food security. An AI tool uses data on soil moisture, wind, humidity, satellite images, and more to predict locust swarms in some African countries. Farmers receive text alerts up to three months in advance of an outbreak. AI-powered models are also providing earlier warning systems for natural disasters like floods and can help map flood patterns to guide disaster response. Here at home, you can see AI in action in some potato fields in PEI. Meet the AgriScout robot. There were a few people who stopped on the road to see what was going on, what this robot is actually doing in the field. It may look like a rover that belongs on Mars, but it's actually helping potato farmers using cameras to look for potential disease in their crop. It will generate a map with the location information. They can load that map on their cell phone. It will direct you where those infected plants are and get those out. We are planning to attach a robotic arm to it that wherever it picks on the symptom, it gets those plants out. And rising temperatures and drought conditions are making wildfire seasons more extreme. Bring in AI. German-based company Dryad is building AI-trained sensors for ultra-early wildfire detection. The company has deployed 20,000 worldwide. These are solar-powered gas sensors. So behind this membrane here is a gas sensor that is um, um, sensitive to hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and volatile organic compounds. So it actually is like an electronic nose. Um, that can actually smell a fire. And we can um, detect fires as small as a campfire, uh, even before there is an open flame uh, sometimes, as long as the gas molecules are hitting the sensor. So we can protect about the size of a football field. AI is becoming more widely adopted across society, and the types of models that we're using are also changing. Some of the models are getting larger and larger. This picture is changing, and we really have to be on the lookout for the growth in AI's emissions footprint. And fundamentally, one thing that is challenging in getting a hold of that is that there isn't enough transparency. AI will continue to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions until we move away from fossil fuels. 
having an energy grid that is less carbon intensive means that for the same amount of computation, for the same model, you're going to have less of a carbon impact. AI is here to stay. We will only use it more and more in our daily lives. But experts say we have to think about how we use it and its consequences. We can't really afford to be distracted for five years thinking about whether the AI is going to be the terminator instead of addressing how it's going to impact uh, climate emissions. Nicole, forgive my ignorance here. Uh, does all AI generate the same level of emissions? No. Um, there are two main types of AI. One is discriminative, and that is simple. For example, I'll give you an easy example. There is, you produce two pictures of a cat, one of a cat, one of a dog. You ask AI, hey, which one's the cat? It can do that. That's simpler. It doesn't take as much computing, and that generates very little emissions because it doesn't take a lot of power. Then there's generative AI that we're more familiar with, with ChatGPT, which generates writing text. And then there's Dolly, which creates images. And it's generative. It is simulating. It's taking data, simulating that, and that generates a lot more emissions. So as that type of AI grows and grows and, and, and expands, what sort of work is being done to kind of regulate the use as, as well as the emissions? Yeah, well, uh, the UN uh, recently formed its uh, advisory board on AI, but a bill was introduced in the US Senate that will is asking to monitor emissions and, uh, and kind of restrict that. Hmm. Wow, so many places to go with this. All right, Nicole Morcularo, thank you. Thank you. And next, a Canadian escapes an Icelandic volcano. We were told that we had to evacuate. Everybody was outside marveling at those giant fountains of lava. The stunning images they captured on their way out in our moment. Oh, incredible. That is smoke, that is lava coming from the volcano that erupted for the third time in Iceland late last week. In the middle of all the chaos is Canadian photographer, Paul Ziska. So he was there on a trip with other photographers before it was cut short by an evacuation order. But of course, they didn't leave without taking some pictures. And tonight, the striking images make our moment. Everybody in the country, it felt like, wanted to catch a glimpse of that eruption. This eruption happened on the very last morning of our adventures. We were staying at a hotel that was about two kilometers away from the eruption. <laughs> Staff came to knock on our door and we were told that we had to evacuate. Within probably 15, 20 minutes, everybody was outside with their luggage, marveling at those giant fountains of lava shooting up into the air. So you have this black canvas and then you add this giant bucket of red. It was just so, so incredible. The plume of smoke just had like an atomic feel to it. Still dark at that point, so everything's just glowing red around us. It was surreal. Beyond the visual, what struck me too was just the noise. It was like this boiling cauldron noise. And we proceeded to caravan off to safety. It was hard. I tried to keep my eyes on the road as much as I could. Distracted driving is just takes another meaning, I guess. <laughs> well, I said he was filled with a lot of respect, obviously for nature, but also for the police who kept traffic, you know, flowing properly. People still had to get to work. He said about an hour after they went through that one evacuation route, the road behind them was full of lava. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.